welcome to today's webinar. It is Q&A with Peter Baker and Ulrich Kolsch. We reviewed all the questions that everyone submitted on the registration form and have divided it out into four sections for today. First, we're going to discuss knowledge management and quality intelligence. And then we're going to move on into data management, followed up by managing a quality team and ending with AI and pharma. If you have any additional questions throughout the conversation, please use the chat feature and we'll try to make questions uh, time at the end to answer some live questions. Uh, before I begin, I want to quickly introduce ourselves. My name is Taylor Minks and I am the marketing lead at Retica Systems. Retica Systems is a data analytics platform helping life science companies improve their quality and stay on top of evolving regulations. Our proprietary process transforms one of the industry's most complete data sets, aggregated from dozens of health agencies and Freedom of Information Act sourcing, into meaningful answers and insights that reduce regulatory and compliance risk. Founded in 2010, Retica Systems serves over 200 customers in pharma, medical device, and food industries, including 19 of the top 20 pharma companies and nine of the top 10 medical device companies. Our first speaker today, Peter Baker, uh, president of Live Oak Quality Assurance, has been consulting nationally and internationally since April 2019. Prior to consulting, Peter spent 11 years as a U.S. FDA drug investigator, with seven of those years spent working in FDA's overseas offices in India, China, and Chile. Peter was named FDA Investigator of the Year in 2013 for his work in covering serious breaches in data integrity and has special interest in data governance and compliance with 21 CFR Part 11. His company, LiveOak, focuses on training and employee empowerment and critical thinking with the goal of improving the quality of medicines through good data management and quality intelligence. Next, we have Dr. Ulrich Kolsch, partner with GX. PCC and has been on the forefront of data integrity initiatives and has supported many organizations in the pharmaceutical and biotech sector, executing data integrity campaigns. Ulrich has experience in consulting for audit preparation and conduction in the GMP and GCP area and is co-heading a pharma special interest or PDA special interest group while being an active participant in other industry knowledge groups. So now I'll pass it on to you too to start the conversation. Yes, hello and good evening to everybody from Germany, wherever you are in the world. Um, and Peter, are you ready? I'm ready, but you got to take it easy on me. Okay. You know. <laughs> so <laughs> we're just, as we're discussing about quality intelligence, uh, less surprise. The first question is, uh, Pete, what is quality intelligence? It's it's an interesting question. I mean, it's a it's a and it's a pretty broad answer to that. So I think what we'll do, Ulrich, is I'll go ahead and share my screen, and and we'll we'll take a look at maybe some of the different components of what might make up a quality intelligence program at any given uh, network. It's we kind of like visualize quality intelligence as a roadmap, right? It's not a it's not something that you can you could just write an SOP for and implement, let's say in the next month or the next quarter or even the next year, right? It's it's a it's a roadmap to success. And it really, uh, it, but like the, let's say the pit stops along this roadmap to success have been provided to us already in the form of regulatory guidance. Some of that regulatory guidance comes in the form of actual guidance documents for industry and, and other guidance, we see it coming in the form of like, for example, FDA warning letters. I mean, especially when they talk about vigilant monitoring of inter and intra batch variability, right? That's one of the stops on our roadmap to true quality intelligence. Like how do we get there? Well, it involves the integration of new risk management tools, and also this concept of knowledge management. Those are the two enablers that Q10 talks about on how to get there, right? And so what we're gonna do is visualize those here in this slide. And it really started back in 2015 with this initial focus on data integrity, right? We had MHRA, FDA, and other organizations publishing these concepts of, of Alcoa Plus, right? This was the foundation for data integrity. So as we want to talk about quality intelligence, we do need this solid understanding or this solid foundation with regard to Alcoa Plus. And, and so we've done that. 
And 211.68b, for those of you who export or are here in the U.S., talks about appropriate controls over computerized systems, right? So we're talking about the risk management all the way since uh, for, for at the first stop. But the, but you know we need to further refine those expectations as we move down the roadmap. And so the second stop is data governance, and this was outlined in the PICS guidance that was became finalized in as a guidance in 2021. Here it provides the next phase of your journey. Started again with Alcoa Plus, but now we move into data governance. And data governance is the integration. It's like how you achieve. Alcoa Plus. It's the integration of quality risk management throughout your operations. It's the how, right? And we talk about design, operation, and monitoring, the three pillars of governance. So that's step two. That takes management's investment, of course, to get there uh, because it's new tools. For example, data and process mapping and also qualitative risk assessments. The next step on our on our uh, quality intelligence roadmap is the quality culture mindset, right? So this is actually uh, achieving process ownership. So when you go out to a manufacturing floor or QC lab, for example, uh, you're in, maybe interviewing a frontline operator. They not only know what is in the SOP, but they also understand why it's in the SOP, right? We don't just talk about quality culture as something that's, uh, you know, just totally subjective or unattainable, right? We can actually do it if we follow the roadmap. Next, we have knowledge management. Again, one of the enablers in ICHQ10. And what, we've ha what we have here is we've, we've integrated not, not just structured uh, data, like uh, in, in, the, um, in the form of like historical numbers on OOSs or things like that, but also unstructured knowledge. So this is tacit knowledge that comes like from the front line. How do you integrate that into your risk management plan? Well, that's called through knowledge management. And the next is visualization, where you're, we're starting to, to visualize our data using, uh, using like, for example, dashboarding. And that's a, probably already been doing that, right? But it hasn't necessarily followed the roadmap to, to, to show exactly what are we reviewing in management review and is it actually what we need to be monitoring, right? Or is it just based on somebody's opinion on what should be monitored as metrics, right? It should be feeding out of like your upstream steps that we've stopped along the way. And then finally, last but not least, we have this true quality intelligence. And here's where we may see the integration of AI ML in, in our operations, right? And with the goal of achieving relationality, that means how does, for example, an upstream pH value higher or lower yes it's within specification right but how could that influence downstream steps like the human mind alone is not able to process those disparate data sets in in an effective manner you'd have to run thousands of experiments over and over and it would be too time consuming to do that right but with the assistance of artificial intelligence and perhaps machine learning as well we can truly get to a point of real process understanding how all these different factors that are, are occurring during a manufacturing process relate with each other so we can truly achieve vigilant monitoring. And of course, this is now further explained in FDA's recent QMM guidance that came out last year. Oh, I'm sorry, last month. <laughs> it, oh, it's actually, I actually think it's earlier this month. Uh, mm -hmm. And what it does is it further refines the expectations that are going to probably be included in the QMM protocol. And so that's how sites are going to be evaluated for maturity. And we see five pillars here. And you can see that each of these, oh, I'll call them categories, right? Each of these categories might relate to where, where, we, where we're going on this quality intelligence journey. So for example, they want to see management's commitment to quality. Like how are y'all going to demonstrate that during a visit, whether that visit come from a regulator or a third party? We're not exactly sure who's going to do this QMM assessment. But you can see how, you know, following this, this roadmap to success that we've already we're already on kind of is going to fit quite nicely into FDA's QMM framework, right? Of course, all enabled by the two enablers in Q10, which is knowledge management and risk management. So that's I think a, quite of a long answer there, I'll Rick, to a very simple question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, but hopefully, hopefully, might make sense to some folks out there. Who, I'm, so most companies are like right around here, right? They're, they're working on governance and FDA explains what this means. Uh, well, it's in the PX guidance, 
but also if you want to take a look at the FDA guidance, it's in there and they talk about workflow validation, right? That's really data governance. That's where we, how we apply it in our workflow validations. Yep. Great. Thank you, Pete. That's a really um, powerful slide, I think. And just for, for a little hint for, for our audience, we'll have a, a workshop on quality intelligence uh, together, Pete and, and myself in, in Boston and virtual uh, next May. So if you're uh, interested in a deep dive into these steps where we really go through the through the different steps, I think that's really worth it. Anyway, you talked um, a lot about the key enablers. So quality risk management, we have obviously got the new uh, revision one of uh, ICHQ9, but the other one was knowledge management. And we got many questions around this topic uh, in preparation yeah. for this webinar. So how would you say, is it possible to develop uh, knowledge management let's say more or less from the scratch. So how do I get knowledge management developed in my company? It's a great question and a lot of questions because I think, you know, knowledge management has been in Q10 for over a decade, right? But it's been, it's been existing there as something that's like, like a theory or, you know, like knowledge management is something that we talk about maybe, but it's not like, a, it's not like achievable. It's more, yeah, it's like kind of like quality culture. It may be fat, fit into that same bucket where it's it's cool to talk about, but we're not actually sure how to apply it, right? And ICHQ9R1 actually pushes us uh, in the direction of true knowledge management. What do I mean by that? Well, for example, in Q, there, was, there was four main major revisions to the Q9 in the newest revision, right? So in R1, one of those is formality, addressing like, look, formality in risk management is a spectrum all the way from a from a risk memo to an FMEA and everything in between, right? And knowledge management is again. I mentioned it in the early when we were discussing that slide. It's a it's it's a it's a library essentially of your tacit knowledge and your objective knowledge. Basically, we could call that your structured data and your unstructured data, right? And so, like for example, you have may have operators out there that have been doing this pro, op, like running this process for the past ten years. They have an incredible amount of knowledge about that process that could be very useful for us when we're trying to determine like, okay, we we'll get an OOS or we get a deviation, right? Like where could we go to leverage all the knowledge we have about our processes to help us determine potential root causes? Where does that library exist? Well, the regulators refer to this library as knowledge management, right? And Q9 sets us up perfectly for success in that area because it says, look, use your qualitative risk assessments right, which is on the informal side of the spectrum to collect this knowledge, right, and put it in a library. PIX calls that data governance, right? So it's taking like, like an like integration, of, or I, I give another example, like a pH meter process. And I've given this example a couple of times recently, because I think it's a really powerful example of this. So we were, you know, we were going through the process of how to do, how to run a pH, which in this particular process was a CQA, like a critical quality attribute, right? So I had to put a lot of effort into this. So we're looking at all the steps in the process. One of them was rinsing the probe, right? B before you put it in the actual sample aliquot to, to collect your pH. And one of the hazards coming out of that, uh, based on previous experience was if you don't rinse it, if you forget to rinse it, because you're not really like actively thinking, right? About the what you're doing, which happens to me all the time, right? <laughs> uh, you might forget to do that. And you would have an artificially low pH, right? Because you, you'd have contamination of your sample, right? Well, we took that knowledge and put it into the library in the form of the risk assessment, right? And then eventually when you do have an OS and perhaps that is due to a low pH, now you can go back to this risk assessment. Again, regulators are calling that data governance program and see, all right, where along this process could we have potential contributing root causes? And if you have a low pH OOS and you have this knowledge bank that says, hey, if you don't do, if you don't rinse the probe, you can get a low pH. There you go. There's your knowledge management program in action, right? You know, we don't just talk about it. We actually use it, but it takes new tools. It takes the tools that are outlined in Q, I should say emphasized in, our, in Q9R1, like for example, the, 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 the uh, qualitative risk assessments. Yep. Yeah, great. That's... Very, very good answer. I think um, we could also talk an hour about this topic. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> a big to leverage risk, risk management uh, and and to, to gather knowledge. But from my side, I also agree with the, with the data part, right? So that we don't only have the 
risk assessment lying there at the beginning and we got our FMEA and it's always there, but that yeah. uh, data feeds back into, into this loop that it's, as you said, explicit knowledge. So knowledge which comes from data and not like implicit or tacit knowledge, which comes just from a feeling, let's say, okay, occurrence, give it a three or a four. Uh, I think that's that's where we really can also get in the, the back feed of, of the data into our, our risk management process. Yeah. And I want to expand on that a second, Ulrich, because you're like, because, you know, say you get an OS or, or a deviation and the investigation goes on and that knowledge, you know, maybe that the person who's assigned to that investigation goes and talks to the SME and then includes that in the body of the investigation. But then when they're, when that regulator comes along and takes a look at that, it comes across as an opinion, right? And so in my, my 43, I'll say there's no scientific rationale or no scientific justification for your conclusion of no product impact or whatever, because that interview with the SME is not going to be considered to be like scientifically valid, despite it probably being a legitimate, like contributing root causes, you can't consider it because it wasn't written into the quality system in the form of the risk assessment. So it appears to the regulator just as an opinion. That's a tragedy in my opinion, right? Like, let's use this knowledge, but in order to use it, it's got to be written. You know, that goes back to the old school FDA saying, like, if it isn't written, it didn't happen, right? So let's get that pen to paper and get this knowledge into use. That's right. a big stop on the quality intelligence. You want to even talk about AI, like downstream. You got to figure these first steps out first. Like, yeah, y'all yeah. know that. What what you bring with with a uh, in your in in the roadmap, right? So that you cannot leave out a stop, no, no uh, abbreviations possible in order to to go through the way, which included uh, knowledge management and uh, data governance also. So I think yeah. it's also our our second uh, big topic today. Um, when you're talking about uh, data governance, you often refer back to the PICS guideline, which I agree is a is a very very good one. Yeah. But of course, folks are wondering now um, about about regulators. So do you have some examples for us um, about recent findings around this topic of, of data governance? So where is it really enforced? Absolutely. And if you look at, uh, like, I, I pretty much read all the 43s that that, that come out. I, I just check the, the, the Redica database, like on a pretty regular basis to see what are, what, what, like, what are the types of observations that are being written? Man, we see, I mean, we all know that for the last like five, I think it goes back to like seven years now, eight, they, when they do the run the analysis on on warning letters coming out of FDA, 80% of those have do, are due to data integrity keywords, like for example, accuracy, loss and confidence in the accuracy of data or completeness of the data, right? And so what we're seeing now is, I think even if you, need, and if you would go back 10 or 15 years, it was like the investigator had to show the the, the misuse of the system. Like for example, I'd have to show a, a data deletion or have to show like a testing into compliance or orphan data, right? In order to get those significant outcomes like a warning letter or something. Nowadays, I think because of the on, especially because the ongoing emergencies, like for example, drug shortages, the, re the regulators are going to have to, they're going to be forced to take a different approach because drug shortages are actually getting worse, not better. Right. And so what we're seeing now in the 43s are like, okay, like a, a data set, for example, an audit trail, um, like a uh like a log in in a in in a WFI system or a purified water system, maybe out in manufacturing. Like there must be a, a written strategy on how you manage that data. Right. Uh, it doesn't have to be like you're reviewing it batch by batch every single day. Right. But you have to have a risk based strategy for all data and metadata in your organization. Otherwise, it's easy for the investigator to go out there and say, all right, just look at this data set. All right. What is your risk based strategy? Is it batch by batch, periodic or as needed? Right. You, you have all three of those buckets you can choose, but you have to have that strategy ready for inspection. So we're seeing alarms being cited a lot. We're seeing. Um, the process for manual integration on, on chromatography being cited a lot. Again, like in a chromatography system, you have so many different data sets, like metadata, like five or six different audit trails. You have to have a strategy for each one of those. Again, doesn't mean you have to review them all, all the time, you, but you've got to have the strategy available. Otherwise, that's an automatic 43 because I think it. I think that the grace period for adopting a, a Adopting the principles in the PICS guidance are are pretty much over.
because that became finalized in 2021. And now we're almost in 2024, right? So this grace period that's often accompanies a guidance document is probably over. And to add one point to that, uh, the Annex 11 revision concept paper from EMA is also very clear on that point <clears throat> that any grace periods, for example, for outdated systems uh, yeah. are over. So I, think I like the wording that they use, has long such expired. I like that one. I like that yeah, one. Yeah, that's good. So yeah. <clears throat> we, we got it long expired. Um, yeah, long expired. And here is an, an opportunity to bring in one of the live questions, Pete, maybe because it fits well. Yeah, sure. um, it's about the, the interlink between data governance, uh, data integrity, CSV, and the quality management system. Oh. I think you already touched based on that, but let's yeah. maybe maybe focus a bit on, on, on the interlink between uh, data governance, data integrity, and, and uh, the QMS part. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, I uh, the concept of, of, did you say CSV? CSV was also part of these four. Yeah, yeah I right. I didn't want to make it too hard for you. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot, right? And so we okay. had this, this um like older mindset the older mindset was like we validated systems right mm -hmm. and then the process was just sort of was determined after the system so our core efforts like our like our um our resources right if we were to steal the word from q9 were put into um validation of the system itself or, or the software and hardware itself rather than integration of that thought process of, of systems validation into a workflow and so FDA addresses this in their in their 2018 final guidance on data integrity. And they say, look, we know that y'all are, are focusing a lot of efforts on what we call CSV, computer system validation, right? But remember that in the in the regulatory mindset, validation is, is for a workflow or a process. In their mind, you cannot validate a system. You can only qualify a system. And so there was this, this like... Um, conflict between some of the industry guidance that was available and of course the the regulatory guidance which really stems from process validation in 2011 right which talks about validation of a process so we talk about data integrity csv data governance all coming together in 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 this in this um in this new way of thinking about validation of processes csv is just a com one component in that activity yeah, yeah, I think that's very well put. Um, and to add add on that, um, maybe two thoughts. Um, you could also think about the formality, right, in the in the CSV part, as you discussed. A risk. It's also a risk uh, management exercise. So maybe we we really need to uh, incorporate um, doing burdensome, not really value adding tasks in the CSV part, in order to to better allocate our resources, as you said. And the second thought, I think, which is also helpful for this answer, is to about data governance as an enabler of data integrity because often it's, it's right. seen vice versa so that we can say okay data governance leads us to data integrity like it's it's outlined in the i will share a paper from bioforum on that uh, which okay. is about the fair data principle i think that's a very very nice way to put it also not to focus so much on alcor as input but it's rather also an output as you said if we got our our systems in, under control and our data governance and our or quality culture in place, then it's almost automatically uh, the output of it. So yeah, I think a lot of, uh, in the, especially when the first guidance came out, man, it was management supposition or like assumption that we just needed to train employees on Alcoa, and then this whole DI thing would be taken care of, right? But again, that's that's not going to that's not that's not enough, right? So training on Alcoa is just that very very first step on the process, right? Governance is how you ensure Alcoa. Training is just part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So I think we we, we got this challenging one uh, quite nicely uh, sorted out. Um, so of course it all fits together. Um, what would you say? Because if we are also talking about uh, about uh, verification or, or review. Uh, this is a, a critical question. Let's say that. What is an appropriate performance metric uh, for non-critical information? So how how would we would we rate what is appropriate or enough? Can you expand on that question a little bit? <clears throat> so, how many? Uh, let's say we got we got um, information which is more critical, like yeah. uh, let's say our, our batch release data and uh, the HPLC data. Let's say, but sure. how can we come to a clear conclusion? How much review is enough or verification is enough? 
uh, for data which is less critical, let's say, ah. the data supporting our quality management system, or maybe even CSV data, uh, data which supports uh, the computer system validation. But let's stay with the quality management system in that in that question. Yeah. And PIX outlines this in the, in their guidance, and they call it non-critical audit trails, right? Or we can mm -hmm. refer to that as non-critical metadata. So they put metadata or audit trails into two buckets. They say critical, right? And those are the ones that you're reviewing, like, for example, before batch goes out the door. That's your batch record, right? Uh, and then you have the second bucket, which is non-critical. Now, the... the, the the easy way out here is to try to develop like one SOP that says, well, for non-critical audit trails, we're going to follow this decision tree, like once every six months or once every year, right? That's one way to go, but I don't think that's the right way to go, right? Because I think that's going to, you know, and I'll steal this from the GAMP, uh, the GAMP, the new GAMP revision. They have a section called M12, which is critical thinking. And in that, in that section, in again, Annex M12, they say the use of rigid tools or overly prescriptive methods is probably going to, and you're, you're going to guide yourself into doing either too much or too little, right? It's not going to, it's not a true risk-based approach. It impedes critical thinking, right? And critical thinking with use of the qualitative tools that we've been talking about and through data governance is going to, it's going to be done on a case by case basis. Right? And so we'll look at a workflow and we'll see all the data and the metadata that's created during that workflow. We're going to put it in a data and process map. Then we're going to go down to our hazard identification, risk assessment, risk reduction if needed. Finally, we come to a risk monitoring. And for those non-critical audit trails, right, we can determine how often we're going to review them on a case-by-case -case basis as it relates to patient safety. Right. This is a really complicated <laughs> answer here, but... So again, like, like there's two ways to go. There's one is you can try to do it like a, with a, like a rigid flow chart. I don't advise on that, all that, that that way, right? It should be done according to Q9 in the risk acceptance document uh, section. Sorry, they say it sh risk acceptance is depends on many factors and should be done on a case by case basis. And what we're yeah. doing here is we're accepting risk, right? Because we're not reviewing it before the batch goes out the door. So let's really truly embrace that guidance and do it on a case-by-case -case basis. Great. Yeah. <laughs> and now as you're an, an ex-inspector, uh, people always like to ask uh, you this question, and of course we got it today as well. Okay. What do you think are, are areas of interest that, interest that uh, people <clears throat> might not have considered in the past so much? It's, it, it's been the same for about five or 10 years now, if you, <laughs> I think, and it's ungoverned data sets. Like, if you're if you're an if you're an investigator and you're looking for like that that easy case to build, just go out on the we'll just walk out on the manufacturing floor or walk out in QC or wherever you're gonna go, warehouse, and look for ungoverned data sets. It can be data or it can be metadata, right? And ask. And so what we're seeing a lot of times nowadays is on 43s, they sit there and they watch uh like operations and they see a, an operator like acknowledge an alarm for example, on the HMI, right? And immediately, now that action has been taken, it's part of your workflow, has to be validated according to FDA's process validation guidance in 2011, right? Since 2011, so over 10 years, right? Okay, so now let's see, all right, you, you acknowledge that alarm, show me your SOPs that are, go that are governing you or, or directing you on what to do here. Right? Is that a critical data? Is it non-critical data? Like, what are you supposed to do with it? Is it a deviation? Whatever, right? And if that data set alarms in this case is not governed, meaning there is no risk-based strategy available, it's an automatic forty-three, right? Yeah. You, there's no way you can talk your way out of these these observations anymore. Maybe fifteen years ago, yeah, you could bring in an SME the next morning and say, ah, that alarm was non-critical and you know, no no direct patient safety impact, you know. And the investigator might be like, ah, okay, you know, fine. But those days, remember, remember what you said, or the grace period for such actions is long yeah. such yeah. right? <laughs> like yeah. now you've got it you've got to bring me in the morning let's say the next morning you've got to bring me that written rationale for why that operator did what they did yeah yeah ungoverned data sets easy low-hanging fruit you've got to get a handle on this yeah. yeah and you also have to consider we got more and more data right and we got the requirement to have a review strategy around all the data and all the data gets more and more as, as we progress and it's uh, factually 
impossible to review all data without having this from your outlined uh, risk management strategy around it. So yeah. we really need to have it also from a, let's say, practical point of view, else otherwise we would review ourselves to death. But you know what's going to happen is, say, say on that alarm data set, all they're going to have mm -hmm. available for the morning is an SME and their opinions. Again, the probably not opinions, but their opinions until they become into the quality, until they become integrated into the quality system. And they're probably going to bring me an S a, a CSV package, right? Mm -hmm. That's all they have. And that violates the principles of workflow validation that FDA outlines in their guidance from 2018 on data integrity. You can't yeah. ensure the accuracy and completeness of data if you haven't validated your process. Because and you focused again on the, on the function of alarm and not on the embedding into the overarching process. Yeah, I'm sure that the, those alarms are functioning from hardware mm -hmm. and software perspective quite well, right? Yeah. They come from some reputable vendor. Fine, that's great, right? But how about the human interaction with the machines? That's where the risk nowadays really lies. Why are cool. we ignoring this? Yeah. Great thoughts. Um, now we, we were a bit with a, with a current situation. Uh, let's have a look a bit into the future also. And sure. we are seeing now a big uh, enhancement of, of the importance of personalized medicine, ATMPs, and so on. Um, and we also got, that's um, almost my my, fam uh, my most liked question of, <clears throat> of today, what we got in. Uh, how do you ensure people follow uh, GMP or PICS um, while regulators are working on, um, while regulators are working on this ATMP uh, document? So it's not yet everything clear in the sense. And I don't think it will be. I mean, the pro if we're waiting for some like very specific <clears throat> guidance on on this particular category of of drug of drugs, it's it's maybe not going to it's maybe not going to materialize, right? Because the guidance for success already exists in ICHQ nine, right? When we're talking about personalized medicines, uh, very unique risks as compared to you know large scale manufacturing, traditional manufacturing, right? But the roadmap to success that we already showed is, is already is, is it's already available, right? Like understand your workflows, uh, aseptic. If it's aseptic uh, operations, great. Map those out, right? From each step uh, along the process, do the hazard identification, do the risk evaluation, right? If you have all that ready, your inspection ready in those in that category ATMP, like today and for many years to come, in my opinion, right? The the tools for success are already there, especially with R1 out now, right? Uh, just further um, emphasizing the the use of, of the full spectrum of formality. And also this one of the other revisions that is core to R1 is risk-based decision-making. It's like, look, as long as you consider, if you're going to make a decision that yes, this workflow is validated, that's going to be our ultimate decision, right? As long as you consider what you know and what you don't know about each of those steps in the process, like some of those are human behavior, it, 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 like an aseptic manipulation. As long as you include what you know and what you don't know about that step, you will always make the right decision as far as how you're going to govern that process or how you're going to validate that process. So yeah, that's an exciting area. Uh, and but again, the tools the tools are there to to come up with a world class manufacturing process, even for these emerging technologies. Cool. So it's. What you say is to you need to to apply your process knowledge, right? <clears throat> Which brings us back to knowledge management of, of your of your end to end process, like upstream, downstream. Like we got it in this personalized medicine areas where we have a medication for one patient, maybe one cancer patient who only has this one chance uh, to get the personalized medicine. So we got <clears throat> could be possible that we have uh, new risks occurring there in, in comparison to classical classical pharmaceutical manufacturing, but we have to take care and, and embed our risk management well in our process understanding. Exactly. It's, it's, the tools are no different than large scale manufacturing. It's just that the hazards and the risks are different, but yeah. the tools we use to demonstrate compliance, I'm using that in air quotes, right? But basically what we mean by that is a high quality product are the same, the same tools. Yeah. Cool. That's a good word uh, to end this one. Now we got many many of our uh, roadmap stones, let's say like that, um, already discussed. Um, we we're also talking about our quality culture in, in the roadmap. So uh, it's of course important if we want to manage a quality team, um, how do we get it 
from our status quo, which might be imperfect, uh, to, to a better state. So what is your <clears throat> advice to, to elevate the voice of quality in, in an organization, which is a very important factor of an intact quality culture? Yeah. And I think it's it's also encouraged, again, in one of the five categories of FDA's QMM initiative that was published a few weeks ago. You might remember from the, the slide that we showed earlier that there was one of the five categories was employee empowerment and engagement, right? Uh, so how do you do that? It's much more than just training uh, or having quality culture day or whatever y'all do, right, out there, right? So this is about process ownership. That is employee uh let's say empowerment and engagement. It means, so when I, again, I, I think we mentioned this earlier, but like when you walk out to the floor, is the does the employee not only know what the SOP says, I mean, we've, all, we've always had to do that from sim, because of simple adherence to GMP, right? But now the next phase is, all right, yeah, you know what to do, what's, what's in the SOP, but do you also know why you do it? So one of the litmus tests I use when I'm assessing someone's maturity is I'll, is I'll ask them like, well, why are you reviewing these audit trails? right? For example, and if the answer comes back with a meaningful explanation for why these audit trails are reviewed, then I know we're on the right track. But if the answer is, well, because it says it in the SOP, ah, we haven't reached that level of maturity yet that we're looking for, right? Which is that, again, to steal from QMM, it's the employee engagement and empowerment. But how do we do that? Through the introduction of new tools. Otherwise, W. Edwards Deming, who's one of my heroes, mm -hmm. would say you would have achieved it last year, right? You would have achieved this goal of employee engagement and empowerment last year. The only way you're going to get there is through the introduction of new tools. And those are the ones in Q9R1. So you mean the, that the tools are really the, the, the main, uh, yeah, the main thing unblocking the road. Uh, which kind of, of tools would you name there? Um, I would introduce two tools. Number one is data and process mapping, right? Mm -hmm. That starts because that's going to facilitate your hazard identification. And then that's supplemented with your qualitative risk assessment. And here's where representatives from the front line are involved in the process. Because look, if you're asking somebody to review an audit trail and they don't think it makes sense, then, then, then let's not do it, right? Mm -hmm. Every aspect of that SOP has to make sense to that operator or to that microbiologist. This is not some fantasy world either. Like you can achieve this through new, but you have to use new tools, you know, mm -hmm. like, and because what's happened over the years is like, we, we started with a 10 page SOP. And then because of kappas and deviations over the past however many years we've been doing this, we've just added more checklists and more, la more lines to the SOP. So now it's 20 or 30 pages long with three attached checklists that actually, if you would take a step back and look from a risk-based data governance approach, doesn't add much value but they're killing the frontline employee. So there's no engagement. There's no empowerment because they're just doing these things that are really not value added. The cool thing about governance is it allows you to recalibrate, right? If you're an existing facility, go back to square one. You know, this is going to be over the course of years and recalibrate. Like, do we need all these checklists? If not, let's get rid of them, right? Do we need all these log books? All this data is already in it. In, a, in an electronic audit trail or a series of audit trails already. So why do we have a logbook accompanying this equipment? Why are we recording when we collect bio burden uh, samples in three different locations at the time, right? Instead of just one, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, I, I could go on and on, right? Yeah. Um, but you want to talk about quality culture or, you know, what QMM says yeah. as, as, as employee empowerment, then, 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 then introduce new tools. Don't just talk about it. Yeah. Right, so you, you you speak for a detoxing of the quality management system. Also, Indeed. In the sense. <laughs> so you get rid of the of the maybe useless parts if there are any, and I think that's a that's a nice point because this will also foster understanding on the front line. You know, if I'm an employee and I'm I'm really feeling that my my tasks are meaningful, or that if I explain my my boss or um, my manager, well, look, I'm doing five things there and maybe they are redundant. So if, if also we got a, a, a level up listening in that sense, yeah, um, then it might foster really quality culture, uh, let's say um, continuously, not just with, with one shot with another, let's say checklist, whatever. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I'm always going to defend QA because I'm, I think I'm hard at QA like person, mm -hmm. right. But, but QA out there, like we've got to be okay with eliminating things. Like in history, we always had this compliance mindset, right? Where, you know, we only add things, 
We only yeah. add checklists. We only add lines to the SOP. We never subtract them, right? We have to change that mindset. Those of us, those of us QA folks out there, right? We have to be, let's just take a look at MHRA's uh, sec section five of their guide document on right environment. Take a look at Q9. Take a look at QMM. All these regulatory guidances are pushing you in this direction. Risk-based approach. A risk-based approach is not everything, right? A risk-based approach we could visualize or we can conceptualize as the least burdensome approach, mm -hmm. right? That's because we have limited resources. And when you when you actually embrace those regulatory principles on the front line, that is employee engagement and empowerment. Yeah, that's a great point. I made good experience with the Gemba walk. Uh, I think maybe one or other heard that Gemba means <clears throat> at the front line. So that means that the management or also the QA really goes to the front line. And I think that is uh, where this exchange can also happen. As Absolutely. I think that's a very and, good and, tool. And just that. go out there and, and do the yeah. Gemba and see, see what you find. I mean, I do it all the time, right? And it's like, well, why are you recording this time in three different places? Mm -hmm. I'm like, ah, mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> Previous <Yeah>. Kappas. <laughs> Yeah, funny, funny fact, I, I had once a, a second uh, recording in the, so the second minutes, hour, minute, second in the in the manufacturing environment. And then, of course, the question is, if you manually record a second, what are you doing? Oh, the next second is over. So you can scratch and write the next one and so on. Yeah. So you will find some 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 interesting things there if you if you go. Can, can we, can we keep going on here, Ulrich? Because yeah. like, um, I'll give you an example because I want to explain what happened next, right? So I'm asking about the three, the three, three places in there, and the, the answer came back from QA. It's well, and they said, well, because if they forget to re record it in one place, I can have it on the other. I can have it in two other places, and I'm like, oh, whoa, we are way, we're like worlds apart here, right? You're thinking about compliance and the ability to close a deviation in 30 days where I'm coming at you from a quality patient safety mm -hmm. standpoint, which is right for truly right first time, right? Like getting it right the first time, you know, accuracy, completeness of data, one, one you know, original record, you know, but you're in the old my, old uh, compliance mindset. I think that's mm -hmm. one, of, you, you want to talk about quality intelligence, that, that this is all the things we're talking about today. You're going to have to leave that compliance uh, brain that we've been like, uh, you know, like taught all these years, you're going to have to leave it behind and move into the future. Whereas we just want it at one place. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Bring, bring this together. Uh, let's, let's talk a bit about technology also. Um, before we start jumping into the AI topic, like we also got questions on that here. I will bring in one later, but um, just uh, technically, which tools technically are you re recommending uh, to be used uh, when we talk about quality intelligence in general? Oh, yeah. So I think one of the one of the road uh, stop, pit stops on the roadmap, which is not true the, to all the way to 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 um, AI ML, but like one of the things we're going to have to do is eventually um, figure out where we are going to place our data, right? So we, we see a lot of um, companies moving into like different different solutions. One of the solutions that companies, many companies are already working on is data lakes, right? Mm -hmm. But one of the things to keep in mind, like as you're going forward on this, right? So you're, you're building these data lakes. Some people are already exploring with natural language processing, for example, you know, it's they haven't quite rolled this out into a live environment yet, but they're working on it. But one of the things we're seeing, Ulrich, and I think you, you have the same opinion, is they're they're going ahead with this without a quality uh, framework. They're sort of skipping data governance and they're running straight to uh, like the knowledge management or, or other steps right down there. But where they're building these data lakes and eventually going to use them to make decisions, dashboards, AI, ML, mm -hmm. whatever they're going to use it for. But they haven't they ha they don't have the quality framework yet, right? Because mm -hmm. you're going to have to show from the beginning from a sensor all the way to that AI ML output from your algorithm that each step and interface is managed for risk. So how mm -hmm. data flows manually or automatically throughout that, that process, you must have a quality intelligence framework developed in your organization at a high level SOPs, QA oversight, all those things. Otherwise, IT is going to come up with these wonderful solutions and you're not going to be able to figure out if you can make decisions on them or not. Yeah, and I think one part is also that uh, the final solution often sounds 
sexy or good or is great to sell like the fancy machine learning algorithm in the end but the first step as you also had in the roadmap is to bring data into, into one repository so that we can really really use it we also had one question in, in our uh, question deck um whether it has always to be uh, ai ml what we use and i think that's a good example this question no of course not it does not always have to be the the, the most fancy solution. So if we got a repository where we got our data nice and it's well sorted with, with strict rules, with good data governance in, in one word, and uh, fulfills the interoperability statement of the FAIR data, then it could be as simple as a dashboard, uh, like yeah. we also had in our course, where we can say, yeah, you can you can learn a lot uh, with pure dashboarding, which uh, everybody can do because we got now this uh, no code or low code solutions uh, at our hands where we can really go into dashboarding uh, and every quality professional could or should be able to do that in order to to be yeah up to date also current in the current good manufacturing practice yeah and one of the hot topics that came up during our last workshop Ulrich was the was the use of jump software that's a great example of how to get started in this world right you're already using it the problem is it's not a validated workflow so everyone's freaked out like if a regulator gets a hold of this and they find out that we're using this we're most likely going to be in trouble and the answer is yeah you are right and so here's a good example of where to start like validate that workflow what does that look like today it's remember validation is of the process. The CSV is only a small part of that, right? Especially in this case, because remember the degree of effort and formality depends on the risk. Well, what's the risk of using jump jump software? Actually, it's more risky not to use it, right? So let's put the effort and formality into validating that process. What is it looking like in my mind? It looks like a data and process map and a qualitative risk assessment with some aspects of CSV into like um, integrated where needed right? Mm -hmm. It's a CSA approach. They like to call it like a risk-based approach to the CSV, right? And also a workflow validation. It's those two things together, like practice with that. If you can get that ready for inspection, now you're on the, now you're you like, you know, baby steps. Now you're ready to talk about like other, other more complex things like dashboarding or AIML. Great. Um, so let's let's now go a bit into the AI ML direction as we already uh, had in the beginning. Taylor already, uh, yeah, gave us uh, the direction for that. Um, what are some examples just to get started? So uh, what can we see? What have we seen in, in in the regulated industry where AI ML really supports a quality management system of companies? Right. Yeah. So we've already seen it um, rolled out quite su substantially in the drug development world, right? We saw news mm -hmm. a couple of months ago, the very first antibiotic uh, candidates uh, coming out of an AI ML activity. That was, that's phenomenal, right? So the future of AI ML and drug discovery and early development is bright and already being used, right? But now let's, and, and also within in the next steps, right? We have G, uh, like the clinical area and that's already being used in that area as well um, with pretty significant guidance issued by both EMA and FDA in the, for the use of AI ML in clinical trials, right? But for the commercial environment, we don't see much uh, guidance at the moment. We see a small paragraph um, integrated into the recent EMA guidance on, on AIML, but the majority of that guidance, again, more dedicated to the upstream aspects like discovery and clinical. So uh, what I see happening in the commercial area, which I think is probably the most the most majority of the folks online today, it's going to be in the, uh, in my opinion, we're going to see a couple of things. We're going to see, uh, like I've seen one recent example where we were, when we were talking about like the loading of components, right? So it was mm -hmm. taking, uh, you know, like it was a robotic arm taking uh, parts from one step and moving them to the next, right? Mm -hmm. And so in the old way, it was, it, it, it was a simple algorithm that was, that was making that decision. But what they did is they integrated uh, machine learning to improve the way that these mechanical arms separated out these mixed up components. Right. Uh, so what, what we talk about validation of that particular algorithm, we're going to have to follow, follow part 1110. Right. And but remember that the level of it says part 1110A says validation for consistent intended performance. Well, what's the intended performance of that? It's simply to separate machine parts on an upstream manufacturing process. The risk to patient safety is so low. Right. That 
the amount of effort and formality to follow Q9 that we put into this is, is relatively low. So that's an easy validation uh, process, right? Some simple maps, some simple risk assessments, and that that AI ML algorithm can go live, right? Um, it's interesting because in that case, the reason why they didn't use it was because the graphic cards were way too expensive. <laughs> so the, the return on investment wasn't wasn't there. But I think in the in the future, the costs of those cards, uh, the computing power, so to speak, is going to come down significantly. The other area where I see great um, potential for this, so that's first category is is, is assembly lines, right? Or uh, uh, like a, yeah, let's just leave it at that. And the second category is in the ability to to manage unstructured data, like for example text in deviations. Mm -hmm. We might refer to this as natural language processing, right? I think the air, the future is bright in that area, right? So how, again, how do you validate this? Well, you, you will have to follow the principles in Q9R1 for sure. The roadmap for success is already there. I think if you're waiting for more concrete guidance from the regulators, I don't know how much co more concrete it's going to get other than what we see in Q9R1. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I've been participating at the uh, FDA workshop, I think end of September, uh, where we were discussing about GMP, uh, commercial GMP um, AI ML solutions. And there, there were two classes of algorithm which were closest, so to say, or most discussed. And the one was indeed the NLP part. So uh, the, the large language models, which can help you to, to um, support your quality management system. Most of these um, implementations were, which were discussed were rather, um, one or two steps away from the patient, like clustering deviations, clustering complaints. So it was not directly impacting the, the patient. And the second uh, point in, in this domain is, is also that the machine is getting really good in that. And I think that's the main point. Uh, we also should consider if we see a risk benefit in, in that sense, um, handling big text sets is not a very human activity, you know, and, and that's where I think that uh, the benefit then comes comes into play. Um, and so I, th I think that's, that's true. You can well start in, in an area which is not too close to the patient also to get uh, your quality management system around all the, the yeah. AI ML stuff uh, up and running, like considering training, validation, test data in, in, the, in the development part, but also um, operation maintenance. Um, what does maintenance mean? How do, I, how do I ensure that my data is not drifting away or my model is drifting away? I think that's a good place to start indeed. And yeah, the second point, just, just uh, finishing that, uh, which was very much in focus, uh, automated visual inspection. So we got, uh, we saw there several talks. The slides will also be uh, published by FDA, I think in beginning of November. So uh, you should uh, uh, have a look on that. Um, and there that we, are, we are we're really close to the patient <clears throat> then, but what yeah. is the big benefit there? It's the home game of, of AI ML algorithms. They were developed for image recognition a lot. So a lot of commercial development is into this topic. And that's why uh, the, the solutions are also can be very strong, I think, and can also bring a benefit. <clears throat> However, of course, the question here gets much more interesting if, if, we, if we talk about validation, because now we are really close to the product. So if we, we have a particle in our product, a, a patient can be harmed from that. Um, if we cluster devi deviation incorrectly, okay, maybe uh, on the long term they, they can uh, get some harm out of that, but not not directly to this uh, this portion, this patient, uh, yeah, this life, let's say like that. But I feel that, that like that like if you're if you're if you're talking about automatic like visual inspection, right, and mm -hmm. you still can't figure out how to integrate jump software into your quality system, I'm afraid yeah. you're you're going to be in big trouble. <laughs> Like that's yeah. why we talk about the roadmap, right? Like, mm -hmm. like practice with these with these easier process workflows, right? In order to eventually get to a point where you could sit down in front of a regulator and defend your strategy for automatic mm -hmm. visual inspection, right? Yeah. Don't try to just jump ahead, right? <laughs> you need to be mature, mature to to steal from FDA's QMM, uh, which brings us back to your roadmap, where we cannot jump from Alcoa plus to AI, which was a complete other part of, of our, right. of our if you, yeah. If your data integrity program involves training in Alcoa, but not nothing to speak of with regard to governance or knowledge management, mm -hmm. um, then I'm afraid this is not going to work. 
But what's your opinion on, on that? Um, will AI and machine learning uh, be one of the main focuses in the in the near future for quality intelligence? Oh, it has to be. I mean, think about natural language processing. Like, what what is the ability of a human now to do to comply with mm -hmm. 192, which says you know investigations must be extended to potentially related products, right? Well, what is it involved now? It involves logging into some QMS. And, and doing a keyword search based on some brainstorming activity that you and maybe your team did. That's, that's super inefficient, right? Whereas we could enhance that ability to, to comply with 211.192 through the artificial assistance, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where the, this AIML assistant is uh, helping us to achieve like real compliance with these regulations. That's a no brainer. Right, that the future of NLP in like for QA is is bright. I mean, that is like that's that's not if that's just like when everybody's going to be using this. Yeah, I agree. It's also a matter of getting getting used to the technology, also to be explainable, uh, so that a the quality unit and b the inspector also is able to understand it. So we also need to to think about that. Um, how do we really explain what happens behind the scenes without being on the level of a of a data scientist? Because you cannot expect, um, and this was a saying also in the in the uh, FDA workshop, you cannot expect the inspector now suddenly being a, a data scientist. So yeah, we also right. need to invest into into making clear, and maybe that's per perfectly fitting to our to our probably last question. Um, um, how do we identify uh, those risks um, which are associated in in, in artificial intelligence in general. Yep. And it would be following the same principles that FDA talks about in their data integrity guidance, which is that workflow validation, right? They give the example in their guidance document of an MES, like, yeah, you can qualify the MES, right? But you don't know if the output, which is the batch record in this case, is is accurate and complete unless you understood the process of how it was generated generally by a human, right? So the same thing with like natural language processing, like you have to have this quality uh, framework in place from the beginning to understand mm -hmm. all the steps that were taken to eventually get to the place where you're going to integrate this into the workflow. We're going to call this qualification now, right? And it, But it's going to be part of a validated process, which is this deviation investigation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have two okay. concepts, qualification of the artificial assistant and validation of the deviation investigation process. Yeah, I think that um, comes well together if we go back a step and think also about GAMP. Um, then we also got the criticality. So that would, of course, also be the first first point to assess risk. So how critical is the step to my to my patient, uh, as you say, uh, in, in, the whole, in the whole chain? Uh, like, for example, the visual inspection would be more critical than the um, deviation um, uh, categorization in that sense. Second, how complex is it? I think we, we also need to see, uh, is the algorithm constantly changing? So is it a dynamic model or a static model? Is it labeled uh, data or unlabeled data? Um, so self-learning or a supervised learning algorithm. And then in the end, the involvement of the human is really the the machine drawing the decision in the end, um, or is there a human behind? And uh, I think in the first implementations of the NLPs, it was often like uh, the the machine learning was the assist giver, right? So um, they they brought the assist and the striker, which is the human, then uh, hits the goal or or makes a decision in, in that picture. I think that's yeah, and you could still supplement it with the with the way mm -hmm. you've been doing it for generations, which is a keyword search, right? So you're just enhancing an existing mm -hmm. process, like. The validation efforts that we would put into that are relatively low because the risk to patient actually is more risky to not use it, right? So let's 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 push forward. But again, let's start with things like like jump. Like let's start figuring this out now, right? Start with data governance. Start with data and process mapping, and then eventually that will be. They're just easy to integrate into our quality system. Yeah, that's a nice frame. So that brings us back to the to the beginning slide uh, where you showed the the roadmap. So we first have to do our homework before we can do the the fancy stuff in that sense. Uh, I think that's a that's a good keyword um, to the end. Um, Taylor, uh, if you want to jump in uh, at that point and and close out our session. 
Yes. Uh, thank you for sharing all your thoughts and perspectives. I always love listening to you to interact. Uh, I highly recommend everyone jump in the chat and click on the link that Ulrich shared at the beginning and look at the training that these two have coming up in May. Um, again, thank you for getting on. We did not get to all the questions. So we'll, us three, will get together and see how we can get those answers over to you. Um, but thank you for joining our web webinar today. And thank you, Peter and Ulrich, for sharing all your thoughts. Thanks, thank Taylor. you for giving us the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Have a wonderful day.